hit high intensity training. Is it dangerous for you? As dangerous as they say, uh, do you, are you going to tear muscles up? Are you going to blow joints apart training that way? Is it so heavy training that way that you're never going to recover? And the most famous one is your central nervous system going to be fried from all that high intensity effort. Well, today we're going to go over these. Okay. So stay tuned. Here we go. I'm John Hart and welcome back to Mr. America Hart. Okay. Today. Now, as some of you know, most of you know, uh, I've been training high intensity for the last 38 years. Most of it, meaning 35 of those 38 years at this point. I've trained thousands of clients at this point as well, who have also trained in high intensity training fashion. And I did not start out with a base of standard traditional training. I started out training with heavy duty, high intensity training by Mike Menser. And I did that for the first three or four years of my training. And then I took a slight detour when I moved from New York to Los Angeles and I was training in the Mecca of bodybuilding. So that's how I landed from heavy duty, high intensity to an, a short brief experiment that I can speak very well from, from experience that I did train in a standard fashion, just like all the other people were training that day. I trained with a few pros during that time period as well, both male and female. And I got to experience exactly the kind of results that come from training that way. So let me go over this. Number one, when it comes to the hurting of the joints or let's say tearing muscles, okay, we have some real life situations that we can observe right here to decide will high intensity training tear muscles versus standard high volume training, traditional training. Well, when it comes to High intensity training, uh, I've mentioned it many, I've acknowledged, I should say, many times before the, uh, you know, the poster child of high intensity injury training was Dorian Yates, six time Mr. Olympia Dorian Yates. Uh, I, I mean, I admire the man and I, I'm, as far as being an athlete goes, and I'm extremely, you know, happy to say that, you know, the results that he got brought him to the top of the mountain and he dominated for six years straight. And during that rise, he came across several injuries. And he's the first to admit that those injuries happened mostly during pre-contest time when he was a little dehydrated, not eating as much food, not as well rested, doing too much as far as cardio and weight training, going all out all the time when he should have been scaling back a little bit as the contest drew near. So that being the case, uh, he's the one person, just the one that anybody points out to when they talk about high intensity training being dangerous and tearing muscles. So far, there's not another name that I know of that y'all have not named one top bodybuilder uh, who's, who's torn muscles up. Uh, You know, anybody who's critical of high intensity training will do anything to avoid having to try to come up with a second name. It just doesn't exist like Dorian because all of the rest of the high intensity trainees, you know, from Mike Menser, Ray Menser, Casey Viator, uh, Dave Masterakis, Aaron Baker, David Durth, I can go on and on, Dave uh, Dugdale, Mark Dugdale. Uh, these are all high intensity trainees who built an appreciable amount of muscle training that way. A lot of them became pros training high intensity fashion. A few of them, once they were pros, used it to get even bigger and get a better physique. And none of them tore muscles. That's the first observation that we can look in real life. The second observation is this. When it comes to performing a high-intensity training set, high-intensity training dictates that you control the weight. That's one of the dictates or one of the, uh, I don't want to say rules, uh, but one of the descriptions of how you can get to the highest intensity is not to throw the weight up and down, but to use the force of the muscle under control, lifting in a two second contraction or positive, and then a four second negative, that is considered a high intensity set, okay? That's considered the, let's just say it's the bedrock, the foundation of high intensity training. So we'll just stick with that because all of the other you know, variations of it that have come up in the last you know, 30 or 40 years, all the other variations, uh, never brought results like 
two up, four down. And if there's a point where you can contract and hold the weight in place with resistance, then you hold it for one second. So two up, one hold, and four down in, in the count of seconds. Okay. So in doing that, if you're using that kind of form, that means you're controlling the weight on the way up. You're controlling the weight on the way down. As the set progresses, the speed is pretty consistent. Now we're talking speed. As the speed from rep number one, let's say it's a set of 10. From rep number one through rep number six or seven, the speed is going to be pretty consistent. As you get around rep number eight or nine and you're approaching positive or concentric failure, muscular failure, what's happening? The speed will slow down. The speed will slow down. That means what was a four-second negative, suddenly you're going to be gasping for air. Even on a curl, you're looking for any break you could get. And the negative is generally kind of a break. So you end up lowering the weight a little slower. And then on the positive, as hard as you try to get that weight up fast, as hard as you can go, as fast as you can try and do it, it's going to still be slower than it was at the beginning of the set. What does that all mean? That all sounds like it's a safer set, right? It does to me. One of the things I could say is it's not going to be dangerous unless you're jerking the weight on the turnaround. The turnaround on a curl, for example, is at the top position. You're turning it around, going down. There's no danger there. On the bottom of the position of the curl, you're jerking it up, or are you curling it up? From the bottom position. From the bottom position, that's the turnaround point. If you're doing a preacher curl, for example, nobody ever tore their bicep at the top position of a preacher curl. It was always at the bottom position. So that turnaround point, when you do a squat, the bottom position of the squat is one of the turnarounds. Okay? You don't want to bounce out of the squat or a leg press. Okay? It's highly dangerous. The forces will amplify. They'll geometrically go up if you bounce out of that position. So in high intensity training, we don't do that. I also do not advocate super slow training just to get that out of the way. Okay. A whole bunch of y'all believe that high intensity training equals super slow and it doesn't. I'm going to put down below an entire video on, on that, that high intensity training does not equal slow motion. That video will be down below. You can hit that link and check it out after you check out this one. So What am I talking about here? The second way that we can know that high-intensity training does not tear muscles up or damage or blow apart joints is as the set progresses and you're striving to maintain not just the same speed, but you're getting closer and closer and closer to total muscular failure on the concentric, the weight is going to slow down. The ability of your muscle to contract that weight with speed, to contract against the weight, I should say, with speed, is going to decline. No matter what you do, you will be moving the weight slower. And even at one point, if the weight gets stuck, you're going to require help to get all the way through to the fully contracted position. That being the case, that's mighty safe. Going further than that and taking an extra forced rep when you can generate even less force, well, there's even less danger with that your training partner has to help a little bit more. If you decided to just hold the weight in place for a static hold after hitting positive failure, that's another technique. Well, you're holding it in place. There's no jerkiness. There's nothing dangerous about that. The muscles cannot exert much force in lifting the weight up, but it can definitely stop the weight in place. You'll find you have that kind of inner strength at that point. That being the case, there's still no danger there. Thirdly, the strongest strength level would be your negative when you're lowering the weight. If you were to go through a set, and if you were to go to positive failure, and then furthermore, have your partner help you up with the weight on the last repetition, and you hold it in place as long as you can, and it starts to fail, now you've gone through your positive and your static strength levels, You're now at the point where you can't stop the weight from going down. So this is all within one set, mind you. So now you're lowering the weight under control in a negative fashion. Lowering it under control is not dangerous again. Doing it repeatedly, though, and the speed of the weight 
going down goes faster and faster. Now it gets a little bit dangerous. Then you have to stop the set before it gets to the point where it could yank a muscle off the bone if you were to have the weight flying down and you're trying to stop it with your bicep or whatever body part it is. So in that regard, that's about the closest we come to dangerous versus in traditional training, the weights are being moved much faster than high intensity training. There are no dictates. There are no recommendations as far as, you know, how fast to lift and lower the weights. It's just lift and lower and pretty fast, mind you. Lifting and lowering the weight with any kind of speed will jerk a muscle in the downward, the, the turnaround position where it's fully extended. And if it's jerking it very hard, it's going to jerk it and yank it and tear either the muscle belly or the muscle from the tendon or the tendon from the bone. The worst of which out of those three could be either the belly of the muscle tearing. That's probably the worst. The other two can be repaired pretty nicely. But tearing the belly of a muscle means that's the end of that, that muscle. It's finished. It does not look the same ever again. Will it operate? Yeah, it'll operate with whatever fibers are remaining. But it won't operate or look the same ever again. So bodybuilding may be out the window for somebody who has that happen. Okay, so handled. Hit. High-intensity training is not as dangerous as we thought when it comes to tearing up muscles and hurting a joint. Oh, what a, oh, as far as burning out the central nervous system. Here we go. This has got to be, I've, I've, I've read that in all the comments in my comment section, like I cannot tell you how many times, okay? And <laughs> I laugh at that one so hard. Your central nervous system is going to be burnt out training once for 30 or 40 minutes max, and then taking two, three, four days off before returning back to the gym and training again. So that sounds like you're going to burn your nervous system out versus doing a high volume of exercise, 10 to 20 sets per body part, per body part. There could be three or four body parts trained in one workout, which would mean 30, 40, to 50 to 60 sets in one workout. And then... You come back the next day and train again. And you do that for five or six days in a row. Sounds to me like that could get pretty strenuous and straining on the central nervous system. And I'm right about that because it does wear you down. So I believe when it comes to bodybuilding and when it comes to training properly that I'm only talking about something closer to the ideal, something closer to what would be considered optimal. There we go. Uh, higher volume training versus high intensity training. One sends a really strong signal, high intensity training to the muscle that you require it to grow. And then you allow it to rest, recover, and then grow before hitting the gym again. The other form, high volume training, you do 10 to 20 sets per body part today for maybe three body parts. And then, well, while those are resting, you come in the gym tomorrow and train other body parts. Well, in theory, that would be great if it weren't for the fact that you are one big ball of energy. And therefore, some of the energy that was going to help the original three muscle groups that were trained today to recover and grow, some of that energy is going to go to tomorrow's workout in stimulating three more muscle groups. I mean, it sounds to me like you think you could borrow from one end to help the other and then somehow miraculously separate body parts away from each other and not have them affect each other's recovery and growth? Hmm, it's not the way that works. So a lot of naturals, I'm speaking about naturals in particular, a lot of naturals have blown their recovery ability and require a lot of time off from training just to get their bodies to get back to what it was in the beginning. A lot of naturals eventually default on go to high intensity training. Train less often. Give your body the ability to recover and grow. The drug users, the enhanced bodybuilders, I named a whole bunch of them at the beginning of the video. Uh, a whole bunch of them have the ability to recover and to grow. Okay, using the drugs, that's doing higher volume training, that's doing high intensity training. 